McDavid and the Oilers have gone packing as the Colorado Avalanche sweep Edmonton to advance to the Stanley Cup final. Boston firing Bruce Cassidy in a shocker move today. What does that mean for the Leafs? What does that mean for the division going forward? And we also have a few mailbag uh, questions left over from the mailbag from yesterday's podcast. We'll get to some of those as well. All of this and more on today's edition of Locked On Leafs. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Leafs podcast, one-stop shop for all things Leafs. I'm your host, Mike DiStefano from TSN 1050 Toronto Radio, also known as Al's brother from TSN's Overdrive and TSN 1050's Leafs Lunch. Joining me, it's my co-host Dave Morissuti from Sportsnet, also a writer for the NHLPA. Locked On Leafs is a daily Maple Leaf-centric podcast, so be sure to subscribe for free. Wherever you get your podcasts from, you can also now subscribe to us on YouTube. That's Locked On Leafs on YouTube. And Dave, we are within 20 subscribers from hitting the 1,000 sub mark. I went out and bought the jersey today. I went out and I bought the jersey. And I'm not going to show it until we hit the 1,000, though. But just know that it's a pretty sweet-looking jersey. I'll say that. So one of the 1,000 subscribers who is subbed to the Locked On Lease podcast, will be getting that jersey. But we got to get to 1,000 first. So send it around, sub up everybody uh, so that we can get to that giveaway. All right, so let's get to the, today's pod, David. We are going to do some uh, leftover mailbag questions. And there's also a tiny, tiny bit of lease news and some divisional news with Bruce Cassidy getting fired by Boston. We'll get to that in a little bit. But obviously, the leading story going into today is – the Avalanche off to the Stanley Cup final, a 6-5 win over the Edmonton Oilers. They complete the sweep. Arturi Lekanen, the second straight year in a row, sending his team through to the Stanley Cup final. Did it last year with the Montreal Canadiens. Did it this year again with the Colorado Avalanche. Kale McCarr, a stud, stud, a four-point night for him. And really the best team in the West has made it through. And this is exactly what I think we all envisioned and pictured a Stanley Cup final being. The best team in the Colorado Avalanche being present and representing the West. Wouldn't you say? Daryl Sutter was right. Whoever drew the Avalanche were in for a pretty miserable eight days. Yeah. Yeah, it's basically what Edmonton got. Uh, quick four-game sweep, and they're out of there. They touched the trophy, though, Dave. They touched the trophy. They didn't lift it but they touched it. What do you think that will mean for them? Are you a superstitious guy? Mm, not overly. Like, I don't believe in the, like the touch in the trophy. Like even Joe Sackick told him, do whatever the heck you guys want. Yeah. This is a guy who's been there, done that. So if, 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 if the boss is giving you the green light to do what you want, um, I think some of the guys didn't want, I think it was pretty split based on what Landon Scott said post game. But yeah, no, I'm not that superstitious. Like, if somebody touched the trophy, I'm not going to be like, oh, exactly, what are you doing? Like, no, I'm not that person. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, it's not my thing either, to be honest. I, I could care less whether they touch it or not, but it's always, uh, oh, are they going to touch it? Are they going to touch it? Are they going to lift the trophy? They didn't lift it, but they did touch it. Um, But a monstrous, monstrous playoff for these guys, and it keeps keeps on going. Um. I quickly want to touch on Kill McCarr before we kind of get into the Oilers and you know the the what happens with them going forward and talking about the great series that McDavid and Drysdale had or great playoff in general. But Kill McCarr, I mean, I, I was having this conversation with Mike Johnson from TSN on Leafs Lunch, and we we're having a discussion of whether or not uh, the the statement Kale McCarr or Connor McDavid has met his match and Kale McCarr deserves a period. Or a question mark. He wasn't quite ready to put a period on that yet. This was back ahead of game three. But I think now at the end of the series, a four game sweep, Kale McCarr, I mean, this guy is a god. He is so freaking good. And Kelly Rudy talked about it at the end of the broadcast um, or in between the intermissions. He was saying he got a text from somebody saying, This is the best defenseman that the NHL has seen since Bobby Orr in terms of being an all around talent. 
-hmm. Now, those are lofty expectations. We need to see this continue for years and years and years because Eric Carlson for a year or two also looked like he could could be that. But Kill McCard to me is better than Carlson on really offensively, but especially in the defensive end. I mean, what's the limit for this guy? Like th this guy could potentially be, I mean, the, the, a top three player in the league at this point. He really can be. Oh, I definitely think so. I'm going to pull up a tweet here from uh, Dmitry Filipovich because I think it just describes what has... If you're trying to figure out ways that the Colorado Avalanche have been so dominant, I think this tweet says a lot. So Kale, I'll read it for the folks who are listening uh, on audio. Kale McCarr and Devon Taves have been in the lineup 78 times so far this season. The Avs are 63 nine and six and have outscored their opponents by 121 goals in those games. And then the reply below is on two. They are the, the abs are 12 and two this postseason. <laughs> that is ridiculous. Yeah. That's quite, uh, that's quite insane actually. Yeah. Cause they, did they sweep Nashville too? They did. Yeah. So sweep on Nashville. St. Louis took two off them. St. Louis is the only team that gave up, gave a real legit fight to the Abs. Yeah, and I, I you knew that was going to happen too because those are two terrific teams. You know, St. Louis is a good club too. Now Edmonton's a good club. I thought that they put forward uh, a, a valiant effort. The goaltending just wasn't there. I mean, Mike Smith, th this guy. I look, they're they're going to say all the right things and and say that goaltending didn't let them down. You know, but at the end of the day. I mean, you're allowing four, five, six goals a night in a seven-game series, which ultimately only ends in four, but you're giving up four, five, six goals in those games. Your goaltending might be the issue, man. Like, He was good in the King series. He did just enough. I'm going to just say this. He did just enough in the Flame series. Cause well, he's were... lucky that Markstrom – looks like an ECHL goalie in that Flames series to allow him to go through. Like, let's exactly. be honest. They finally went up against a team that, frankly, they were overmatched in every aspect. And it showed, especially goaltending. D Darcy Kemper went down. Frankly, I wasn't concerned for the abs because yeah. even though Francis is not exactly world class, I said him against Mike Smith. I'm still going with the Avs goalie. Like, yeah. Seriously. And it the Avs, it did not shake them one bit. To well, a big shot. reason why you're going with the Avs goalie is because that also means you're going with the Avs defense, which was rock solid. I mean, you just saw the numbers there with Kel McCarr and Devontae's when they're out there for the team, what they can do. Um, and, and they're just so, so good. I mean, really stifled McDavid uh, as much as anybody has been able to do in – the entire postseason, like really almost rendered McDavid ineffective throughout a majority of these games. I mean, the guy, I think he finished the, the series. I think I saw with one rush chance at five on five. That's Connor McDavid, the fastest player in the league, only able to get one rush chance because they did such a good job of staying on, uh, staying on top of him and not allowing him to get the edge and cut to the net. They just weren't allowing him to do that. And that's where his his game is sometimes at his strength when he can do that and then just deke out the goaltender. Um, yeah, the, 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 the Colorado Avalanche are a handful. And whether it's the Island or the, whether it's the Rangers or the Lightning, whoever that is going to end up going through representing the East, man, is that ever going to be a difficult, uh, difficult challenge uh, for them uh, taking on that squad. So the Oilers, though, before we move on, a uh, couple of couple of newsy items here. We knew that Darnell Nurse was dealing with something, playing through a torn flexor, torn Ouch. hip flexor, and this happened at the end of the season. So the entire playoffs, this guy had this torn hip flexor, and he gutted through it. Um, and, and you knew that he was injured. Everybody and their mother knew that this guy was battling, and you know. It was a big reason why he couldn't shut down the offensive dominance of a McKinnon or a, a Landis Gog or a Rantanen. He just couldn't. Right? He just couldn't get that push off of his leg because his hip was shot. I mean, it's pretty simple, really, when you look at it. Um, but, you know, just gutting through that, though, was huge. And then 
Leon Dreisaitl didn't quite say exactly what the injury was, but man, you saw him today. Uh, there was that one play that, it, you know, he went into the boards or whatever and ends up taking um, a hit on the ankle and he was hobbling to the bench, hobbling. I thought he was done, uh, but the guy decides to stay out there. And I think he ended up with what, four assists tonight again, like guy ended up with three assists after he had already torn up his ankle. Maybe even all four of assists came up after that. And it I was just amazing. It Actually it did because I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, you know what? This guy's an unreal passer. Cause he got the puck to Zach Hyman. He didn't really move. Right. <laughs> like he just kind of was there and shot it uh, to Zach Hyman. who was cutting in who made a nice play. Um, but yeah, the hats off, I guess, to the Edmonton Oilers. I thought they, um, uh, they played, they had a good playoffs at the end of the day, but it, it's, it's so tough to beat that Colorado squad, but Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl finishing with 34 and 33 points, um, Dreisaitl with 34, McDavid with 33. And that is the most points scored in a playoff since Evgeny Malkin did it in 2009. The kicker is that. Malkin did it in 24 games en route to winning a Stanley Cup. McDavid and Dreisaitl did this in just 16 games. 16 games. Leon Dreisaitl in 16, both of them in 16 games, averaged over two points a game. Yeah, there was, um, I had I had a bet in this series that almost cashed. It was McDavid, McKinnon, and Dreisaitl all to score three goals in this series. Mm, I think I may have taken that bet as well. Now that I think about it, and the only one that didn't get it was Drysaddle, mainly because he was passing the puck, and also he also could not really skate that much. So, it, I think the 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 assist machine in Drysaddle had a lot to do with the fact that he just could not play on that ankle as well as he could have, and he had to be more of a facilitator than he was a goal scorer, which I think also wasn't great for the Oilers as well. They needed him to be that goal scorer, and he just couldn't get that done either. You know what, though? I, I, Drysad doesn't get enough credit for his playmaking abilities. I totally. remember the NHL – well, I think we looked into this. Uh, every year they put out their player poll, the, the Athletic does their – or the NHL PA does their player poll, <laughs> and one of best playmakers or passers, Drysad came up. And in my head, I'm like, I always look at Drysad as a scorer, a finisher. The guy – you know, it was like a rocket contender each and every year. And then in this series, I looked at it and I said, oh, yeah, okay, makes sense. Because the guy just sees seams that no one else can see, and he puts it right on the tape. It's just astounding, um, the, the passes that this guy can make. He truly is a playmaker. Dreisaitl was unbelievable. McDavid gets so much love, but, like, Dreisaitl himself is also a top, you know, five to seven player in the NHL. Uh, sitting shotgun right alongside him. Not a Batman and Robin. They got a Batman Superman combination uh, in McDavid and Dreisaitl. And someday I think that team, those that duo is going to win a Stanley Cup, um, but not going to be this year. Obviously, uh, they get eliminated in four games. A clean sweep by the Colorado Avalanche. Uh, last word, I guess. Your thoughts on the series or Edmonton's future? Man. They get a goaltender. Let's see what happens with this. Oilers. I don't know. There's going to be a lot of question marks because they don't have a lot of space to do a lot. And what happens to Evander Kane? Yeah. 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 He would fit like a glove, didn't he? The second he got there, like that guy was unbelievable. One of the best, most productive wingers in the NHL since signing in Edmonton. And um, yeah, I don't know if they're going to have the money to sign him, but boy, was he ever a big part of, of that team getting that far? I know obviously suspended for game four sucked. And if that's the end of, of Kane in Edmonton, it's a pretty crappy way to go out. But uh, yeah, you got to think that they're going to have to make some move to prioritize to get that guy back in the fold. But everyone knows his off ice situation. There's you know some, some financial hurdles that he has to overcome. And, and at the end of the day, He's somebody who can't really afford, quite literally, to take a discount to stick with a team that he wants to. He kind of is going to have to chase chase the paycheck for a little bit. Um, and I don't know if Evans is going to be able to do that. Goaltending-wise, as we know in Leafs Nation, as we've taken a look at the goaltenders, there's not a whole lot of guys who are out there 
that are available. I mean, what if Jack Campbell went over to, to Edmonton potentially? I mean, that would suck. That would really suck if uh, if Jack Campbell left Toronto to go to Edmonton. I don't even want to talk about it, actually. No, I don't know why. I, I, I hate you bringing that up. Yeah, why would that even go into my brain? You're right. Screw me. Why don't we take a break so that I can go and hit my head against the wall? And while I'm doing that, you can tell uh, – you can you can talk. Yeah, go away from the screen while I go and talk to everyone about Built Bar while you just go and bang your head on the wall. I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. All right, folks. Don't you love a chewy chocolatey brownie? What about a caramel brownie with caramel swirled on top? Sounds delicious. What if I told you you can have all that chewy chocolatey deliciousness plus 17 grams of protein? You're in luck because caramel brownie bars are available at built.com right now. And you got to act fast because they are a fan favorite. Forget about dessert. These are better than the dessert. Plus, the macros are unreal. 130 calories, 17 grams of protein, and only 4 grams of sugar. I replace a regular brownie with Bill Caramel's brownies in a heartbeat. And the best part, the caramel brownies are covered in 100% real chocolate. Like, guys, it's real. I eat them all the time. I had a friend of mine try a Built Bar the other day. He could not believe how delicious these Built Bars were and how healthy they were. And all Built Bars are made with cal- with collagen proteins, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. They are a, there are a million reasons why you should try Built Bars, but for now, let's just say that caramel brownie will rock your world. That's not an understatement. With Built Tasty is the new healthy. Go to Built.com. To get your box of caramel brownie bars right now. Also, you can get 15% off if you use the promo code LOCK15. So make sure you go to built.com to use the promo code LOCK15 to get 15% off your order. Welcome back into the Locked On Lease podcast. I'm Mike DiStefano. Dave Morsuti with me. We are your hosts here at Locked On Leafs, a daily Maple Leafs podcast. The Leafs might be done, but we're not. We're here Monday to Friday, each and every day with new podcasts. So make sure that you're subscribed, whether that's wherever you get your podcasts on audio form, or you can check us out and subscribe to us. Ideally do both, actually, on YouTube, because we are so close to hitting a thousand subs. And once we get there, we got a Leafs jersey to give away. Uh, So I'm excited for that. Um, excited for you guys to get that opportunity to get yourself a brand new Leafs jersey, um, courtesy of of your friends, Locked On Leafs, Dave and I. All right, uh, what do we want to get into first? You know, let's get into the the, the Leafs news, and then we could do the mailbag questions uh, a little bit later on. So, um, actually, let's talk about Bruce Cassidy really quickly because it kind of filters into the Maple Leafs in a way, or at least. We're going to make it because this is locked on Leafs. And that's what we do. Uh, but Bruce Cassidy, bit of a shocker. Like, I, I did not see this coming out of Boston. I don't, there was some slight rumblings when the season first, when their season ended. Like, oh, could Bruce Cassidy, could they get rid of him? And it was like, okay, once a few days had passed, I assumed, not nah, they're going to bring him back for another year. Boom, hammer gets dropped yesterday. Bruce Cassidy, literally 7 p.m. news dump on a Monday. And He's out, gone, sayonara. Uh, They're going to get a new coach uh, in Boston. But, Dave, like, why do you think this happened now? To me, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense why they decided to to fire Bruce Cassidy, who's a great coach. Does it maybe suggest that they're thinking they're going to be taking a step back next season and they just want a, a fresher, new voice? to kind of help that because Bruce Cassidy, probably not a guy who's, who's looking to suck over the next couple of years. No, and with not only that, with the way that the Bruins are, they're not in a position right now to completely take a step back, right? They got Pasternak. Oh, didn't even realize Pasternak on the last year of his sweetheart deal. Bergeron still has three more years left. Taylor Hall has three more years left. Yeah, Charles but Bergeron... I was speaking with um, Pete Blackburn today, who's Bali Sports. He's out located in in Boston. He told me today on on uh, Leafs lunch, he is seventy percent sure that Bergeron's going to retire this year. Retire? Wow. He's seventy percent sure that Bergeron's going to retire. 
you look at the rash of injuries that have come and the every it seems like everybody on the Boston Bruins is is uh is ended up getting surgery. Marshawn's out six to eight months. You've got Grizzly out for six months. McAvoy's out for six months. Mike Riley's going to miss the start of the season. And then you may not even have Bergeron. That's a lot of your core that's going to be out to start the season. Mm-hmm. Like that coupled with potentially the news, like those injuries coupled with maybe the news that Boston got that Bergeron might be leading retirement. Perhaps that was the kind of final straw for where they said, okay, we're going to fire Cassidy. Maybe we'll take this thing in a different direction. Yeah, Pasternak coming up on the final year of his deal. You could get a haul for that guy. Taylor Hall's on a decent contract, $6 million bucks for a top six winger. You could probably still move him and get something. You know, I, I think that this, to, to me, to me, is this, I could be completely wrong when it comes to, to this theory, but I just get the sense that they might be going in a different direction and taking a step back a little bit. I just think personally, they're going to try one last, like give one last go at everything. Right. And just maybe the seeking a new voice could change the direction of the club. It did once. Yeah. Right? But Where was there a to... problem with Boston? Like I thought they were a good team. It's, it's not like it was a, a stale group that, you know, that's where it's a little confusing. It's not like a Paul Maurice situation where they haven't gotten over the hump and, and it's it, the message got stale. I didn't get that sense with Bruce Cassidy. I thought he was a great coach, and this is a team that's made multiple playoff runs under this man. Well, he's they, – yeah, they made six straight – I mean, and every year he's coached, they've made the playoffs. They made it to the conference finals yeah. in that year that they lost to the Blues. Like, that was their best chance. The cup final. Made it to the cup final yeah, that right, year. Cup final against the Blues. They, I mean, they were close a few times after that as well. Like, you know, conference final. Ask Leafs fans how they feel about Bruce Cassidy as a head coach. There are a lot of stunned Leafs fans when they saw that, right? So, I, I just think maybe they're just ho- they're hoping a new voice can potentially re- reinvigorate this group in some way. Uh, that's the only thing I can I can think of. I also think that there was there's a bit of pressure on uh, on Sw- on Don Sweeney here. I think his seat is a little hot too, and usually when the coach's seat is hot, he's got a he's got to do something right. And sometimes it's not the right decision to get rid of the coach. Um, but I think uh, I think Don Sweeney was feeling a bit of pressure here and, and didn't want to come back with the coach, have things go bad, and guess what? Both out of there. Yeah, that's possible too. Um, you think this has any bearing on, you know, what this could mean for that division at all? Um, it could. Yeah. I mean, that division is, it's, I think other than the central, well, maybe even the centrals. Yeah. Maybe the central It's the hardest division in the league. I mean, I think the Atlantic is the hardest division in the league. Personally, I mean, you think of like, the team one through have. one through seven, yeah, I would say so. One through seven, one through eight, however many. Yeah, uh, we're definitely leaving out the Sabers of the of the Red Wings, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, but even those two, I think, are going to have decently strong seasons next year. They're like, gonna they're gonna push for it. I, I think it's right. the hardest division, and that's why I think Boston's thinking we don't have many chances at this left. We might as well give it a shot now before we completely have to tear down, like. They got some guys that they'll keep long term, and there's other contracts I'm looking at. I'm just like, oh boy, like they locked into Hampus Lindholm for eight years. Yeah, that's yeah. not a sign of a team that wants to take a step back, in my opinion. No, it's it's not. But you also are hearing a lot of the same stuff about Chicago, and these are two teams that have pretty much had the same core through the same time. And now you're hearing, I know they just traded for and signed Seth Jones to an extension, but now you're hearing that. Well, they're listening on Seth Jones now because that's a team that's going to take a step back. I, I, I think I, I, I just I feel different. I feel like the Bruins realize that this might be a chance to reshuffle what they have. I think um, McAvoy, probably Pasternak, will be considered untouchables. You see if Marshawn wants to stick around in Boston or if maybe he would like to go and you know compete for cups for over the last couple of seasons that he has left in the NHL. 
and it, it sounds as if Bergeron potentially is retiring, and then you try and trade Hall, trade Halla, you know, whatever you can do, and you kind of retool a little bit, and you build around McAvoy, Pasternak, and Jeremy Swayman, that young goaltender. That That's just... You know what? It'll, it'll probably depend on two things. One, if Bergeron comes back, then my my point is moot. This is all based on Bergeron retiring. Also, if they hire a veteran coach like Barry Trotz to replace Bruce Cassidy, my point also would be moot because I think that Barry Trotz is probably not looking to go to a a contender or go to a rebuilding team. No. Probably going to want to go to a contender, and that's where the Bruins have to sell them on that. So unless I see a veteran coach who you assume would want win now, or we do see Bergeron return uh, next season, I just don't see this team. Uh, I, I don't know. I think it could be them going in a different direction, but we'll see. But one of the interesting little statistics that uh, the Bruce Cassidy firing – does do for the Maple Leafs. Can you guess who is the longest tenured coach in the Atlantic division? Would it be DJ Smith? No. No? Damn, who is it? Well, it's John Cooper. Oh, shoot. John Cooper. Oh, my God. Yeah, sorry. I forgot about Cooper. So John Cooper is the number one, but do you know who the second longest tenure it is now that Bruce Cassidy has been fired? Another man, well, everyone else, I guess, shuffles downward, and the guy who is currently the second longest tenured head coach in the division is? The Sheldon Keefe? Sheldon Keefe. I thought the DJ man... Smith was first. No, Sheldon Keefe, I believe, isn't it? I thought DJ Smith was hired before the 2019 season. You know what? I am incorrect. You are correct. Is Sheldon Keefe second or uh, DJ Smith is second? Sheldon Keefe is third. Still, like that you that put, right. that puts Sheldon Keefe in the top three. Yes, yes. I don't know why I had that that mixed up. Actually, here I got a list here. I'll pull it up for the good old folks at YouTube because I know they love the visuals, and we are a video for, you know platform here. Is this Those in the are- NHL? This is in the NHL. I mean, we can clearly see that the th- three of the top 10 coaches, longest tenured coaches, are in the Atlantic Division. Sheldon Keefe is the ninth longest tenured coach in the NHL. And he only had his first full season in the league this year. And he's the ninth longest tenured coach. It's ridiculous. Like, it shows, like, if you're looking at why certain teams are in the positions they are in, Maybe look at that, that that stat. And like those who are calling for Sheldon Keefe to be fired, Jared Bednar has been there for a while in Colorado. They failed to get out of the second round for so long. Rod Brindamore, I mean, they've had a little more success in lease, but I'm not hearing Rod Brindamore's name getting called up to being fired. Uh, we know what Craig Berube has done in St. Louis, but like I'll leave his name out of it because he actually won a cup. But I'm looking at those ones that didn't win. Bednar, Brenda Moore. I can't believe Tom McClellan has been longer than <laughs> Sheldon Keefe. My yeah, God. I mean, hey, it's, and they turned things around this year, which probably helped save his job again for next season. Yeah, like uh, th- this is this is where I think uh, if we're getting, putting a leaf scoop on this, if those calling for Sheldon Keefe to, back, to be fired, you can't put what happened in – runs with uh you know i'm looking at you know keith i'm looking at like what the washington and two bruin series that involved uh that keith was not involved with i don't know why people are all of a sudden getting this whole fire sheldon keith thing when it's not really on him oh it it, it is and it isn't Sheldon Keefe has lost the same amount of playoff series that Mike Babcock has lost at this point, though. I will say, I mean, the Columbus one, it's a little different. That's on him. I don't know what the hell he's doing in game five. He completely reshuffled the deck chairs, and they had Willie, who hadn't played center in forever, decide to be, okay, you're going to be our number two, and we're going to go all out with a Tavares, uh, Matthews, Marner line. 
and then we're going to have Willie be our number two center, and that blew up in his face. So then the following year against uh, against Montreal. Montreal, he didn't make any moves because he didn't want to make a, a, any rash decisions like he had done the previous year, but even that bit him in the ass. This year, I think he he did, you know, some... This some was his... Things, right? this was, I think he learned. He yeah. learned from the last and, years. And that's what happens, right? So I'm sure Jared Bednar, same thing. He's been at the job since 2016. He's learned through those losses, and eventually his team is now going to the Stanley Cup final. Hopefully, one day, Shel- we can be saying the exact same thing about Sheldon Keefe. And, and, and I personally believe that it's possible with the group uh, that they've assembled. So if there's anything that you can look at and take from what Colorado has done, a team that, you know, there was question marks of whether or not this core could do it, whether or not they could get over the hump is the coach, you know, do they have the right coach in place? Is Joe Sackick doing the right things to get his team there? A lot of the same questions, you know, three, two years ago were being asked of the Colorado Avalanche are being asked of the Maple Leafs today. And hopefully in the next couple of years, we can see the Leafs, make that leap that we are watching the avalanche do currently. Yeah. Like that, if I'm looking at a team, if you're, if, I, I hate making comparables in that regard, but really the abs are like the Leafs in many ways. Yes. And they finally got the right formula for this year. And, but they stuck with it. They didn't make sweeping changes. Like really what, what big change they hadn't changed the core. They, the goaltender, they they like Grubauer left and they brought in Kemper, which is a lateral move. It wasn't even like a big no. time, big time move. I'll say this though, just because I know there's people screaming in their cars or screaming at their screen as we're watching this, saying, "Yeah, but look at the the money that the the stars are taking." Right, McKinnon's on a discount. Kadri's only making four and a half. Landeskog's making seven. Rantanen's making less than than ten. And McCarr's only making nine. So, like, their superstars are making, like, single-digit numbers. Whereas you look at Toronto, and you've got three guys making double digits. And then you've got a couple more who are making some pretty high amounts as well. Right? So, that's the one difference, to be quite to, to be fair, I suppose, True. of why maybe Toronto won't be able to tinker and add around the edges to get to where Colorado has gotten. But, man, you, you got to have hope. You got to have hope. Got to have faith. Maybe hopefully it happens. I don't know. We no one knows the future holds. But you gotta have faith uh, that that it could happen and trust that the process and trust that what you've seen over the last uh, season or two out of Sheldon Keefe and the Maple Leafs, it's trending in the right direction. And you saw that happen with Colorado, and then eventually the right nucleus was there and it all clicked. And here they are, going to be representing the Western Conference in the Stanley Cup Final. Maybe the Maple Leafs within the next three seasons could be doing the same or two seasons since that's the, the Matthews doomsday clock deadline two exactly. years they have, but we'll see. We'll see what, uh, what happens there. All right, Dave, why don't we um, take one more quick break? When we get back, there is a uh, somewhat of a signing actually that the Maple Leafs uh, made. And then if we have time, maybe we can get to one or two leftover mailbag questions, depending on our time limit here. Uh, so that's what we got coming up on the other side. You're listening to Locked On Leafs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Welcome back into Locked On Leafs. I'm Mike DiStefano with Dave Morissuti. We're your hosts here at Locked On Leafs. Uh, all right, Dave, there was a signing today, not an NHL signing, but an AHL signing for the Toronto Marlies. They signed 21-year-old goaltender Luke Cavillan to a two-year AHL deal. Um, this isn't new for the for the Maple Leafs. They did the same thing with Keith Petrozilli, did the exact same thing with Dryden McKay as well. So they now have a few guys who are signed to uh, AHL contracts that they're hoping one of these dudes turn out to be a goaltender. Whether it's a starter or a backup, this team has had so many problems with developing goaltending. We talk about it all the time. James Reimer is really the only guy in the last two decades that this Maple Leafs team has been able to draft and develop into somewhat of a starter like somewhat of a starter yeah, that they brought in t- that can that came and turned into their number one exactly um and, and they're hoping they've got so many darts that they've got now 
hopefully one of these guys turns uh, turns out to be a, a player. But to tell you a little bit about Cavalan, uh, went 36, 14, and 4. The Flint Firebirds, the OHL this year, um, who had a, an a OHL best 36 wins through the regular season, hit a 9-10 save percentage with that team as well. So, you know, Cavalan looks like he had a pretty decent year. I'm not going to lie. Like, I personally did not scout him or – watch much of him he's an overage goaltender typically their numbers are inflated a little bit just because they are older and bigger and they filled out and a little bit more mature um but we'll see what he can do with whether it's in the echl or the ahl um but he signed to a minor league deal and hey perhaps he could become the uh you know a, a future goalie in waiting for the toronto maple leafs leaves have a lot of goaltenders in the system they do they do like you're, you're talking about you have Eric Schalgren likely going to the NHL next year at this rate, just because they got to get, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I think actually he's still, he's still waiver exam. So he's still able to go to the Marlies there. I think ideally they signed two goaltenders better than Eric Schalgren next, next, next year. Yeah. But, no, in, in terms of, yeah, they're uh, cap maybe, permitting cap permitting cap. That's the thing. Cap permitting right now. A pencil him in as the backup until they find someone better. Joseph Wool just signed a new three-year deal, so he's likely Mar- and he's still waiver exam, so he's going with the Marlies because he just has not been health. He hasn't had a really a, a full. It's probably the most he's played in a long time. Uh, Ian Scott, man, he's he just hasn't been able Can't to be healthy at all. And then. The, you talked about those two goalies that the Marley signed. Those are separate uh, deals there. I, I would assume that you could maybe put one of you could probably put both in the ECHL. If you tan, plan on going with the Joseph Wall, Eric Schalgren, potentially with the Marlies. I think there's ways to make it work. Um, and the Leafs also had a goaltender that they drafted in 2020. In the 2020 draft, a Russian goalie. But those guys take longer to come here as well. So two Russian goaltenders actually, because they drafted one in the sixth round last year. Right. Um, so both of those guys uh, playing for the same team. And funny enough, that sixth rounder from last year, I was curious when I saw that they had signed him, and, and I knew we were going to talk about the goalies in the system. I was like, let's see what this guy did this year. Pretty good numbers. I was playing in the MHL, which is like the AHL, I guess, of the uh, of the the KHL league. So it's a KHL feeder league. So whether I don't really know how to grade out the statistics from that league, but through fifty six games, he's only what 18, 19 years old. Uh, a buck seventy nine goals against and a nine thirty six save percentage through the regular season. A two fifteen goals against and a nine nineteen save percentage through thirteen playoff games uh, for Vashislav Peksa, who was the Leafs' sixth rounder last year. So that's an interesting name. Arthur Oktiamov is the other goaltender that you're referring to, who they drafted in. I think it was the fourth round um, in twenty twenty. Yes, I want to say yeah. So he had a bit of a different uh, a different year for him. He ended up playing most of the season in the VHL for the um, Akbar's Kazan feeder team again. So through 38 games, a 269 goals against and a 912 save percentage. And then he played one game up with the big boys in the KHL, a 414 goals against and an 810 save percentage. So it, it'll be interesting to see if either of these two goalies can turn out to be um, a stud. But what I do know is it seems like the KHL has done a pretty good job of developing goaltenders. Uh, you can look at Andre Vasilevsky. You can look at uh, Igor Shosturkin, Ilya Sorokin as a couple of more recent examples of mm-hmm. KHL uh, or Russian goaltenders who have turned out to be superstars. Maybe one of these two. Can, can be the next goalie of the future for the Maple Leafs. Yeah, I mean, you you have to be patient, right? The Rangers were patient with Shesterkin. The Islanders trying to be patient with Sorokin. We know the Lightning were with Vasilevsky because they had Vasilevsky and Ben, ben Bishop at one point. And it, it's he, was only, he was only, what, like 21 when he, when he came yeah. over? Like, he was younger than Sorokin and Shesterkin. He was like 21, year, I think, when he came over and yeah, started he, to play because a lot of these guys don't like leaving Russia right away. They like to yeah. make they can make some decent money in Russia. They're playing pro. Well, that's it, right? Like most goaltenders, it takes them a little bit to become NHL ready. 
So they would rather play pro and make millions of dollars in the KHL and then come over when you're ready to go, uh, like Sorokin and like Shesterkin, than you would if you're like an 18, 19 year old. You're coming, you're just going to play either in the the CHL, which some goaltenders do, or you're going to put around in, in the minor leagues and make not a great contract. So that's typically why you see that happen. Uh, I guess where you'll see like 24, 25 year old Russian goalies finally come over at that point. That would be why, which yeah. we happen with one of these two guys as well. Yeah. And you got to have as many you know, barrels in the chamber. However, you know, you, you want to give yourself the best chance to find a diamond in the rough there. It's yeah. hard as we're finding it. It's very hard to get that stud goaltender. Uh, usually drafting is the best way to do it as you're seeing with a lot of teams who have really good goaltending. Yeah. And the other one um, we had talked about it before he signed an AHL deal earlier this year was Dryden McKay. He's an interesting name as well. He was the guy who he won the Hobie Baker, didn't he? In the, yes, in, in the NCAA as the best player in college hockey, four year senior um, for the Minnesota state university ended up winning the, the championship with Minnesota state, a one thirty one goals against and a nine thirty one save percentage this season with the squad, a 38 and five record as well um, on route to winning the, the frozen four national championship. The problem with him is he was expected to play for Team USA at the Olympics, and there was some sort of drug controversy. He got popped for a banned substance, and he's not going to be able to play with the Marlies. I, there's he's got like some sort of six month ban uh, of some kind. I think he's he'll be ready to go by the regular season, but yeah, I don't yeah. think he can go and train with the team until September, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I believe that was the co- the case. Yeah, so. Um, whether or not he's a guy who we get to see earlier or later, I don't know, but he is 24 years old. So potentially somebody who uh, has decided to season up in the NCAA and potentially in the next couple of seasons um, could work his way into the NHL, kind of like the way we saw Shalgren at uh, 25 years old, work his way uh, into the NHL this season. So Dryden McKay is another young leaf goaltender that hopefully – they can turn it into something, but there's a couple of names out there, you know, and and at the end of the day, goalies are voodoo and you just never know. You just never know. Um, Well, I don't know if we have time to do the mailbags. Why don't we roll them over for tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's roll those over for tomorrow. Yeah. We had some news to talk about. We got lots of time, folks, lots of time to get to these questions. Lots and lots of time. We've got an entire off season of time to get into uh, into whether or not we want to trade away Jake Muzzin. Um, tons of time to, to to discuss it. All right, so uh, we'll leave it there then, ladies and gents. Uh, That's going to do it for us today on the podcast. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked On Leafs podcast on all podcasts and platforms and receive daily. Leafs content. Follow myself on Twitter at Make It a Score Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morisuti. And uh, also follow the show at Locked on Leafs. Leave a like if you're watching this on YouTube. Please subscribe. We're so close to a thousand. Um, and also leave a review as well if you could and comment down below. That would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Uh, we'll be back with another, another episode tomorrow. But until then, keep it locked right here on Locked on Leafs.